lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota, and SixFootMama.com. This is Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling. Still Growing is a gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow. Hi there, everyone, and welcome to Still Growing, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. Well, I want to start the show out by welcoming new members to our listener community. It's in a Facebook group that's called the Still Growing Podcast Group, and all you have to do is go to Facebook and search Still Growing Podcast Group, and then you can click to join, and I'll admit you into the group. Another way to find it is to go to my website at sixfootmama.com. That's the number. 6 ftmama.com and there's a link to the group right in the menu. It'll say Facebook group. So go ahead and ask to join. I'd love to meet you in the Facebook group along with these new members. Carrie Engel, Laura Leopold, who happens to be my oldest friend. So she requested to join the group. I was so tickled to see her. We have known each other since we were three years old. So very exciting to see Laura in the group. Linda Lemus Virta, Bonnie Wagner, Mary Cobb Rouslot, Catherine Weaver, Edith Kropf, Susan McKenna, and Patricia Chandler Newport. So, welcome, you guys. You know, the Facebook group is a listener community that I created so that guests of the show and listeners of the show could interact with one another, share their garden stories, learn from each other. And it's also the place that I go when there is a giveaway for listeners of the show. So if you ever want to win one of the awesome garden giveaways that are usually offered on a weekly basis for listeners of the Still Growing Podcast, get in that Facebook group because that's the pool of people that we pick winners from. The Facebook group also gives me a chance to stay in touch with listeners in between episodes, and I curate content for you guys, and I share it in the group. So I'm going to give you a little sampling of some of the things that made it in the group this week, just to whet your appetite a little bit, and hopefully I'll see you in there. The first thing I shared is this 2016 Best Books on Gardens and Outdoor Life. It was published by Gardenista last week. And what I love about this list is that the books that are in here are a little more obscure. They're books that you wouldn't normally see, let's say, uh, being advertised on a gardening website or magazine. So that's what made this list special. And I'll highlight just a few of them. The first one that caught my eye is this book that's called The Oldest Living Things in the World, and it's by author Rachel Sussman. This book has a beautiful cover, and it really is about living things on the planet that are over 2,000 years old. It's a fascinating book. And then there is this one that's called The Irish Garden. Kendra of The Irish Garden wrote, even if there were a lot of Irish garden books about, and there aren't, the reading of this one would be required. The photographs are certainly a draw, but it's the voice of the author, Jane Powers, who is a garden correspondent for the Sunday Times in Ireland, which is particularly engaging. So you can get The Irish Garden at Amazon. It's $40.80. But this is just a sampling of the books that are in this best books guide from Gardenista, and I loved it. I thought they were all tremendous. So give that a look if you join the Facebook group. The next thing I wanted to share was this really wonderful piece from Garden Design Magazine, and it was their guide to conifers. And what they did a really nice job of is taking images of cuttings of different conifers conifers from all over and a very nicely done piece that highlights the different structures and the names of each of these different conifers. So give that a look. Now, there was a really adorable piece on this site called Balloon Juice, and it's by Annie Laurie, and she published it in December 4th of this year. And she was talking about this burst of wildflowers that she had stumbled on in December. And actually, they were frost flowers. So it's a it's a fun little piece. And of course, frost flowers are the little 
formation of frost flowers that you get out among the leaves or in the lawn that happen when we get a frost. It's a really a cute, cute little piece. You've got to check it out. Then there was a wonderful post by... Let's see here. Oh, it's the architecture firm WOHA, and they had designed the Oasia Hotel downtown in Singapore. And this hotel, I kid you not, is covered in plants. And they took a picture of it. It's striking. You've got to see the Oasia Hotel downtown in Singapore. There's nothing like it in the world. Barbara Ivusik put together this really lovely post on 14 garden tricks to get a professional professional look. And she wrote that if you believe that a great garden is always the result of a professional landscape architect and gardener, then we're here to tell you that that does not have to be the case. And they put together a pretty decent list of tips and tricks and hacks that you can incorporate to have a really professional looking landscape. Let's see, I'll give you a few of these tips. First was to lay a small patch of decking that is designed just for setting up a table and chairs. And it's also kind of off the lawn and away from insects, that kind of thing. They showed how just even a small little pad in the garden somewhere just elevates that space and makes it look much more thoughtful and planned out than just plopping your you know patio set or lawn set anywhere. Then they talked about choosing stone. And they said stones were a great way to keep the garden easy to maintain and give a minimalist, chic look. But one of the things that they pointed out is how to pick the stone that will give you the most professional look. And then finally, they talked about using minimalist raised beds to look contemporary and really clean up the garden space. And that's exactly what I talked about with Tara Nolan when she was on talking about her book, Raised Bed Revolution. So check that piece out. That was very, very insightful. I thought it had a lot of quick little tricks that we can all incorporate into our gardens. On the food front, Dorothy Hamilton wrote a piece that celebrated black chefs and farmers in Detroit. Detroit's food scene has been exploding in the last couple of years. The Washington Post called the Motor City a food mecca, and it's been named one of America's next hot food cities. And at the same time, the city's urban farm movement has been increasingly in the spotlight. With They, they have over 1,400 active farms and gardens, and And that is just setting up a wonderful base for chefs in Detroit. And this piece is all about the group of chefs that are getting new attention, black chefs and farmers. And there's a new dinner series called Detroit Grown and Made, and it's featuring these chefs. And it was launched by this woman named Davida Davison. Davison launched the series with chef Max L. Hardy and Peter Dalinowski, the owner of a pop-up restaurant venue that's called Revolver. And their goal is to celebrate the black farmers and chefs that are helping to grow a more just and equitable food system in Detroit. On a lighter note, I shared Dolly Parton's famous cinnamon bread recipe just in time for Christmas. I don't know why I'm so drawn to celebrity recipes, but I just am fascinated by the things that they enjoy and like to eat, the recipes that are special to them. You know, there was this piece that had appeared in The Guardian as well, and I shared it because the headline said, Loneliness, Affordability, and Green Spaces, The Challenge of Building Livable Cities. And I was so struck by the words loneliness and green spaces appearing together in the same headline. And I wrote to the group that that just seems like an impossible combination to me because I just interviewed Megan Kane and we had this exact conversation that once you start to garden, friends just come to you. I know I've met most of my most lovely friends thanks to my garden. And she had, Megan had just moved into this house on the corner and had basically cleared away the lot in order to put her garden in place. And just doing that drew people to her and her husband, and they made all kinds of friends in the neighborhood. So I found that to be a very fascinating article, Loneliness, Affordability, and Green Spaces, The Challenge of Building Livable Cities. 
Well, Garden Answer put together another cute video. If you're not following Garden Answer, you need to because they do a wonderful job. And this week they shared their instructions for how to make a kissing ball with evergreens. And, you know, there's a quick short version that's going around Facebook, but I tracked down the extended version. I think it's about eight minutes long. And then you get some audio with instruction, which I always appreciate. So that video got shared in the Facebook group this week as well. So once again, I'd love to see you in the group. Just go to Facebook and search up Still Growing Podcast Group and request to join. Well, my guest today is Robin Perer. She's the author of The Plant Lover's Guide to Hardy Geraniums. And The Plant Lover's Guide is the series by Timber Press. And when they're focusing in on a plant, they really try to search out the nursery person that is an expert in that area that truly knows the plant. And they really fit the bill with Robin Perer when it comes to hardy geraniums. As I shared with the group, Robin is a wonderfully knowledgeable plants woman. She is a generous teacher and a thoughtful spokeswoman for true geraniums and pelargoniums, which is the plant group that most folks refer to as geraniums. In fact, even after interviewing Robin, I still slip and call geraniums geraniums instead of calling them pelargoniums, which is what I should be referring to them as. Robin helps clear up this confusion, and she understands this plant family better than almost anyone on this side of the globe. And in typical mom fashion, when it comes to hardy geraniums and pelargoniums, she loves them both the same. Well, hi there, Robin, and welcome to Still Growing. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Well, I tracked you down after finding your new book earlier this year in the Plant Lover's Guide series by Timber Press. And of course, you were a natural choice to author this book featuring hardy geraniums because of your specialty mail order nursery, which features plants in the geranium family in Kentfield, California, in Marin County. And your nursery is aptly named Geraniaceae for the family of flowering plants placed in the order of generalis. How do you help folks pronounce it? Well, I tell people about geraniaceae because uh, geranialis, people usually don't go to that level of of, uh, distinction with the family. Geraniaceae is really easy. So what you do is you think about geranium, which everyone can say, but you don't say the um, you say gerani. And then you add the word ace, like like a playing card. Gerani, A-C-E. You spell the word ace. So Gerani, A-C-E. Oh, that's Gerani, great. Gerani, A-C-E. It's really not, not too complicated. What you do, that pile up of vowels at the end terrifies people, but uh, you don't need to be terrified. It's easy. <laughs> that pile up of vowels. That's exactly right. And that is Latin at its finest, right? There's a lot of vowels. Yes, that's true. Well, what's the best part of owning and operating your own nursery for 33 years? Well, when I I think about this, it's it's easy, really. It's the people that I meet. They're just fabulous. I have the best luck because gardeners are, are such fine people, and uh, they're so enthusiastic and knowledgeable. And so I love the plants, but I really, I really love my customers. We have a very wide range of of customers, people who are just starting uh, with the plants uh, or just beginning gardeners, and then also right up to people who are very sophisticated and have garden plans and um, lists and uh, specific colors they want in the garden. So there's a very wide range of people who buy plants from me. Wow. And we were talking in the pre-chat that you had just sent off an order to Japan. So you're worldwide. I can send plants to some countries, but not to others. Um, I'm not allowed to send plants to uh, to the UK or to Europe uh, because of the, um, the uh, um, agricultural regulations there. Um, but I can send to China, Japan, and some of the Asian countries. 
And uh, I can't send to Australia or New Zealand because they have very rigorous regulations regarding uh, regarding the importation of plants. Okay. And do you have a busy season or do you grow year-round and sell year-round? Well, I'm very embarrassed because I grow plants in Zone 9B. <laughs> and I always feel I have to apologize for this because everyone else grows in a much more rigorous climate than California. But um, we do grow plants year-round. Um, some plants have a natural dormancy, and if they look like they're not going to go dormant, we cut them back anyway. But uh, we generally propagate year-round. We're in a, a very charmed environment here. Well, that's lovely. Well, my daughter just joined the debate team, and every good debate starts out with a definition of terms. So I thought we could follow that approach here because people get confused when we're talking about geraniums because the term is applied to many different plants. And I read an article in the Mercury Press recently where you said something that I absolutely adored. You said, botanists propose gardeners dispose. How did the whole mess with terminology in the geranium family come to pass? And of course, can we blame two guys, one named Carl and the other named Charles? <laughs> we can. Um, we can blame them, but um, we probably, well, I like the idea that, that gardeners are resistant to the things that people propose and, uh, you know, change comes along all the time. Of course, gardening is is a science as well as an art and so it's inevitable that uh, people would want to uh, Im- you know improve the nomenclature and, and refine the the way that uh, the plants are described so there's not a problem with that what happened originally uh, was that the geraniums that people were familiar with uh, which are the ones we're talking about today were all over Europe in fact they're in every country in the world except Antarctica so uh, people were familiar with them and primarily and originally as medicinal plants. Um, so that the first geranium described, at least in the literature that we can, we can find, comes from the 13th century. And that was a geranium called um, Robertianum, or sometimes called Herb Robert. And it's still around today, um, making a nuisance of itself in, in people's gardens because it seeds very freely. Anyway, it was described uh, in the 13th century, and then later on, uh, we have geraniums turning up in the uh, 16th century. Geranium macro rhizum was one of the first. But uh, Carl Linné, also known as Linnaeus, produced his great work on how we describe plants accurately in 1753. And when he did that, he looked at all the geraniums that were around uh, that he was familiar with in Europe and he um, ratified the name geranium. He said that these are all geraniums because he, he classified them in a particular way. And it wasn't until, I think, about the middle of the, the 18th century that there was a Dutch botanist called Berman who produced a wonderful book um, that was called Rariorum Africanorum Plantarum. And I've seen it. I, I touched it one time in a, oh in a bookshop in England. I was allowed to go into this locked room with white gloves, and they brought it out from the, the safe, and, and I was allowed to look at it. And he was the first to describe uh, Pelagonium as a, as a separate uh, group of plants because... What had happened was that the Dutch East India Company had gone to South Africa. They were going to the Dutch East Indies, and they were refueling at the tip of South Africa. And when they did that, the the, the doctor and the captain and some of the people who were, were interested went out into the hinterland and collected plants. And what they collected were pelagoniums, which are in the geranium family but look different from geraniums. And they brought them back to Europe and... Um, Berman looked at them and said they're different and I'm going to call them pelagoniums. But, you know, botanists propose and gardeners dispose and nobody followed him because botanists can say something but they've got to get a consensus from other people before the name will be accepted. So 
anyway, it was the height of the French Revolution when Le Ritier de Brutel, who was the Charles, uh, decided that these plants were really different. And so he actually separated them in a book that was published in 1789, I think. Well, it, it wasn't because um, it, Paris was in such a state at that time because of the revolution. It actually came out in 1792. But um, again, um, botanists said, yes, this is, he, he's correct. There are, there are substantial differences between the two the two groups of plants between the geraniums of Europe and the pelargoniums of South Africa. We're going to uh, we're going to follow the RTA, Charles. So uh, anyway, it was uh, we can blame them. I mean, they were correct. Well, Linna- Linnaeus was not correct because he didn't have enough to judge uh, the uh, the plants on, and then he didn't change his mind. And then uh, the RTA was correct. But gardeners at that stage said, pooh, we don't care. Uh, We're going to call them all geraniums. So we've inherited this mess, and I'm a one-woman band saying the pelargoniums, which gardeners call geraniums, are not geraniums, they're pelargoniums. (laughs) (laughs) Well, and it was unfortunate timing more than anything, right? Because it's the French Revolution, and Mm. I had read that at the very time he is you know, creating this distinction between the South African geraniums and what which and the, which are the pelargoniums and the wild geraniums, yeah. uh, there were books being written, and the books that were written at the time called the pelargoniums geraniums. So timing just was really not on the side of coming out with this new classification. Well, I think this is true, and and uh, also. Um, uh, Loritier's book uh, probably had very limited um, in, uh, distribution because uh, uh, because of the the revolution. But uh, gradually, uh, botanists came around, but uh, but the gar- but gardeners didn't. And uh, in a way, it's a pity because there's endless confusion. I try to say I, I'm I, I'm always I always try to say geraniums as opposed to pelargoniums. But um, I also give people the third degree. Well, they will call up and ask for geraniums, and I say, well, what do you really mean? Can you tell me a little bit about what you think they are? <laughs> it's awful. <laughs> it's the, uh, I guess, the not the drawback, but it's it just goes with the territory when you're running a geranium nursery, right? <laughs> yeah, it is. Well, it's, the, the main thing is to make people happy and not to give them something they don't want. Yes. Um, yeah. Well, first, why don't we talk a little bit more about the plants that most people think of as geraniums? I know my grandma Hazel considered them geraniums, but they're actually the pelargoniums. So if, if our audience listening so far isn't thoroughly confused, let's try to help them grasp onto what is a pelargonium. These plants are from South Africa and they have what's called bilateral symmetry with a pair of upper petals that are different than the three lower petals. And ever since I I read this, now when I look around and I see the bilateral petals, it completely made sense to me. So sometimes these bilateral flowers are referred to as rabbit ear flowers because the top two petals stick up like rabbit ears. And once I read that, I could completely see those little ears sticking up. So I love that analogy and it's really helped me identify these bilateral flowers in the garden. But these pelargoniums are the plants that most people think of as geraniums, but classification-wise, they are not. They are classified as pelargoniums. What else distinguishes them, Robin? Well, what I usually tell people is look at the structure of the plant because almost all pelargoniums, not totally all, but but all of the ones that that are common, are little woody sub shrubs, which means that they have permanent woody structure, woody base, and then maybe annual green growing stems. They don't die down in the winter; uh, they're they're permanently like that, and they just continue to grow throughout their lifetime. So that's the first thing. Uh, the second thing, as you say, is that the structure of the flower. 
all the geranium family have five petaled flowers, but the pelargoniums have larger upper petals and lower, slightly narrower petals, except when they don't, because not all of them do. And of course, the problem comes for gardeners when they look at double flowers, because you can't uh, you can't tell the difference then. Uh, what I tell people also is uh, that look at the color because geraniums, hardy geraniums, the true geraniums, don't have red or yellow flowers. So if your flower is, is uh, red or yellow, it, it's, uh, it's a pelagonium. It's not a geranium. Oh, interesting. It's just a very quick way of looking at something. If it's red, it's a pelagonium. If it's not red, uh, then it may be a geranium or it may be a pelargonium. But but if it has a woody structure, then it's almost certainly a pelargonium. Hmm. Well, and anyone who has had a pelargonium, a a red pelargonium, I think about you know when they're done blooming, how that stem gets so woody and you kind of just snap okay. it off. Is that is that the right way of thinking about these? Well. You know, pelargoniums will continue to grow throughout their lifetime, and sometimes um, customers will tell me about a plant that they've been given by a family member, and it's you know a number of feet long and wide, and it has a, a little ruff of leaves on the end and one flower. And I tell people usually pelargoniums need to be pruned. So um, some people don't like to prune, and some do, but uh, they really respond to being pruned. And the other thing about them is that they're, I think, fairly short-lived plants. I mean, they will survive for a number of years, but they look successively worse as they get older and older, usually. Um, I think after about four or five years, it's a really good idea to uh, take cuttings, make sure they're well-rooted, and then um, throw the old plant out and start with a new plant, because they just look fresher and better when they're uh, younger. Oh, Robin, it's so good to hear you say something like that because I have friends that, you know, we're in Minnesota. And so if somebody says to us, you can save that plant, you can bring it in, you can wrap it in newspaper, you can, you know, put it in your root cellar or store it in your basement. I tell you what, we feel compelled to act on that and to do that, to save those plants. And in this case, and I, I finally gave up because I thought, oh, it's just too much work. And once I had four kids in five years. I was not saving plants anymore. So (laughs) it's so great to hear someone, you know, that's an expert in this field say, don't work so hard to save them because they do better with a cutting. They do better with a fresh cutting. Yes, I think that's true. But you want to make sure that the the cuttings are well-rooted before the the onset of winter. I think that's the main thing we take away from this. But uh, much easier, of course, to look after cuttings in the house than it is to, to deal with a, a huge plant. But, yes. uh, but I, I also think they look better um, as, as, as younger plants rather than very old plants. Yep. Well, there's nothing like seeing a fresh geranium in the nursery, right? When we go to buy, or a pelargonium, excuse me. There's just nothing better. The leaves are so soft and so green, and the plant structure looks fantastic. It doesn't look all scraggly. Um, They look great when they're brand new in the spring. Yeah, I think this is true, yeah. Yeah. Well, the whole focus, the whole rest of the focus of this interview is on the hardy geraniums, which are often referred to as the true geraniums. And these plants are basically wildflowers. They are our native wild geraniums. And they should be rightly called geraniums. They are classified as geraniums. They have radial symmetry, meaning that the five petals radiate out and they're essentially alike. And these are plants that people uh, can call geraniums. And they are either called hardy or true geraniums. And you went with the title hardy geraniums for the book. I decided on hardy geraniums because there a lot of them are winter hardy. Not all of the geraniums are hardy down to very low temperatures. Um, most of them seem to be grouped in the 5 to 8 to 9 um, USDA 
zones. There are a few that are hardier than, or well, that are adaptable to zones lower than zone five, but uh, I thought hardy was a good idea. Some of my customers, however, say that hardy, does that mean that, that uh, they will resist me while they're growing? And I say, well, you know, uh, they're, it's really referring to cold hardiness. Now, it doesn't refer to heat hardiness. That's something different. Um, and we are just accumulating information on heat hardiness because I, I can only tell other people what what my customers tell me. And if they don't tell me that the, the plant has died during the, the, the middle of the summer, then um, then I don't know. On the other hand, I live in a, a, an area where the summers are very hot, so I, I do have a, some idea of, of the tolerance of these plants to summer heat. Hmm. But um, when I'm talking about hardy or true geraniums, to distinguish them from pelagoniums, I sometimes say... Pelagoniums are what gardeners call geraniums, because then then that gives somebody else somebody a, a hook to hang them on. You know okay. that they're they're not the pelagoniums. They're not the the, the 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 plants that gardeners call geraniums. They're something different. Hmm. But it's a, it's a confusion, and it's uh, it's one that I deal with almost every day. So it's it's a pity that we have to go through these contortions, but. Uh, um, I'm hopeful that eventually uh, everyone will, will know that there, there, there are two separate groups of plants, both referred to by the same name. You know, the nursery industry could help us along here by Fair. by labeling these plants correctly in the same way that now they're labeling all plants, pollinator plant, pollinator plant, you know. They could do the same thing with pelargoniums, couldn't they? They could, but they don't. And I always think that it's it's kind of rude of them to do that. They think the customer can't manage it or, or what, you know. Mm-hmm. I, I'm, I'm not terribly happy with the nurseries that do this because I think it's it's relatively easy to explain to people or at least to put both names on a tag, you know, to say this is actually a pelagonium, but gardeners call it geraniums or something. Yes. Something like that. Well, and these uh, true hardy geraniums would be great in native gardens, right? They're, they are part of the native well, landscape. Some of them. We have, we have some wonderful native geraniums in the United States. Um, they're not only um, plants imported from Europe. We've mm-hmm. got beautiful ones of our own, and uh, geranium maculatum being one that's, uh, that's very widespread in the East from which there have been some selected plants that are really attractive. Well, I like the idea of getting the industry on board with helping us <laughs> improve our language when it comes to these flowers. If for no reason, then uh, I think people can handle it and it'll help people understand better what they're planting and what yeah. they're getting into with it, especially since pelargoniums are annuals in so much of the United States. Yes, that's true. Gardeners are really smart people. I, I think that, that you know we can we can manage these things. It's it's only one word change. Yes, you know why are geraniums called cranes bills? I've also heard them referred to as storks bills. I know it's terribly confusing. There are there are four genera in the geranium family. There are the hardy geraniums that we've been talking about and the pelagoniums we've been talking about. But there are two other genera that we haven't mentioned. One of them is erodium. And these are a group of um, mainly alpine plants that are found around the Mediterranean. But we also have two of them in the United States as well. They're fascinating plants. They're primarily for rock gardens and containers. And... uh, then the other group are a group that have just been uh, lumped together uh, called Monsonias and Sarcocolans, and they are now known as Monsonias. Lady Anne Monson was a friend of Linnaeus, and he named this whole uh, genus of plants after her. So geraniums come from the Greek. The word comes from the Greek word for crane, and I believe it's a diminutive. So geranium, geranos, Crane, crane's bill, because they the it was thought that the seed beak of the geranium looked like the beak of a crane. Okay, so that's where it comes from. Erodium 
Um, the erodos comes from the Greek or the Greek diminutive for heron. And uh, then pelagonium comes from the Greek uh, pelagos, a uh, mini stork's bill. But people confuse them. <laughs> and sometimes erodiums are called stork's bills for a reason that I have absolutely no idea about. I, I, just, <laughs> I just don't know. <laughs> We, we really invent troubles for ourselves. So to go back again, Geranus means uh, crane, and the uh, genus is given the name of crane's bill. Okay. And really, whether we're talking about crane's bill, stork's bill, I know what the seed looks like. It looks like a beak. And yes. so across the board, all, is all of the seed heads for these uh, this uh, plant family, do they all look like beaks, basically? Yes. Yes, they all look this very similar, and okay. that's how you can tell it's a family. Okay. So you, even if you knew nothing else but looking at the at the seed of these plants, you would say, oh, the uh, pelagoniums and the geraniums are related because the seed looks exactly the same. Now, it isn't exactly the same because it depends on the number of seeds that are held at the base of this long beak-like structure. They look just to visually, casually um, the same. Okay, well, that's now, very the helpful. one thing I didn't mention about pelagoniums, separating them from geraniums, which is really kind of important, is that the nectar tube on pelagoniums, you can see it on the outside of the flowering stalk, and it appears as a little bump. Geraniums don't have it. Their nectar tube is inside, so you can't see anything. The flowering stalk looks totally... Uh, and this is I'm talking about the, the individual flower. The, the stalk looks perfectly regular, but with pelagoniums, you can feel this little bump, and that's the nectar tube, and that distinguishes them. Okay. Now, sometimes the nectar tube is right at the base, and sometimes it's up in the middle of the stalk, and you just have to look carefully to see it. Okay. But, but it's there. Well, in one of my favorite gardening blogs, Pear Joy, Joy Albright Sousa wrote a great post about hardy geraniums, and it was called Mistaken Identity, True Geraniums Deserve a Place in the Garden. So it's continuing this whole uh, notion of mistaken identity of these plants, you know, being misnamed. But then there is this other element of the overuse of the red pelargoniums, you know, in a America, especially in the heartland here. Joy wrote something that I wanted to get your reaction to. She said, I have found sometimes when I suggest a specific type of hardy geranium on a client's planting plan during the planning stage of garden design, I get the feedback, I don't really like geraniums. And they are inevitably thinking of their grandma's clay pot of orangey red mop heads and are simply looking for something different for their own garden. So my question to you is that overuse of one particular plant, one taxa in a family like the geranium family, can really cause a PR nightmare for the entire rest of the clan. So how do you respond as, as a nursery owner, someone who specializes in the hardy geraniums, but also the pelargoniums, to gardeners whose initial reaction is, oh, geraniums. I don't want that. And they just disregard your, the whole family out of hand. I do have customers like that. And, and what I explain is that geraniaceae is a real family, uh, just like your own family or, or your friend's family. And there are people that you really love in the family. And there are also people that um, you feel you don't necessarily need to spend a lot of time with. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> So <laughs> that's that's usually what I say, and and it's true of this uh, of the geranium family. I mean, if you don't like um, pelargoniums, that's fine. You don't have to have them. And uh, and I think it was t true that in the 1950s and 60s, particularly, the the red geraniums were incredibly popular. Uh, certainly, they were in California, and uh, you see them in old gardens and uh, as survivors in, in various locations and. Uh, we've moved on and we've found other things in the family that are equally interesting and uh, that um, that are a little different structurally so uh, people can enjoy them in a, in a new way. I wouldn't feel hung up on the fact that um, just because uh, 
you know, a relative had red geraniums that you have to dismiss the whole the whole family. It's an incredibly variable family, and it's fascinating when you get to know it a bit. Yes. Well, in the plant world, there are givers and there are takers and everything in between. But from a gardener's point of view, hardy geraniums are truly givers because they require so little from us and they offer so much beauty. I was thinking of my Johnson's blue geranium uh, that I have in my cottage garden in the back and also in my garden in front of my porch. They are truly (coughs) versatile plants and they're survivors too, aren't they? Well, I think they are, and it's really because they're found in such a wide range of climates, uh, in soils and situations, and many of them originally, most of them originally, were wildflowers. Within the last 30 years, there's been a, a, there have been breeding programs with uh, to breed more interesting and better hardy geraniums. They were brought in from the wild originally, and uh, and some of them are still cultivated, literally plants that you could have collected in the wild if you'd gone out into into the bush somewhere. Um, I just think that they're they're fascinating. And part of the wildness means that they're tough and yes. they're easy to grow. And uh, some of them seed around. I'd feel conscience-stricken if I told you they didn't, but they do. Uh, some of them don't. Um, and it just depends on what you select. And if they do seed around, are they totally thuggish where you couldn't pull them or are they easy to pull? They're easy to pull out. There are a few that you need warnings about. And okay. uh, I think in the book I've, I've mentioned the ones that, that you should be genuinely frightened of and avoid. Okay. Um, but um, most of them are, are easy and not many of them see. Some of them do, though. Okay. And it's just a matter of finding out which are the good ones and which are the bad ones. And I think I've told people, generally speaking, what they are. Now, I listened to a recent interview that you gave with Jennifer Jewell, and you said that hardy geraniums appeal to gardeners who subscribe to the belief that it's a sin to have any bare ground in the garden. I just love this line that you had. And hardy geraniums are really a great supporting cast because they do act as fillers in the garden. And even though they're simple flowers, how can hardy geraniums play a role in the garden, in garden design? How would you utilize? them or suggest that people use them? Well, usually with hardy geraniums, there are a few exceptions to this, um, geranium roseanne being one, but a, a lot of them flower in a particular season. So most of them, almost all of them, in fact, are spring flowers or spring into early summer. There are some that are spring through summer, but very few that go right through the fall. Okay. So uh, I I really think that they're they're the supporting cast in that they come into flower and they're wonderful when they're in flower. They can be uh, masses and sheets of flowers, but then you need something coming on because you'll have mounds of green leaves afterwards. Now the leaves are sometimes quite interesting, but you need to be growing things through them or around them or over them. The flowers that flower through summer often are ones that have long trailing flowering stems and they rest on other plants. So they kind of fill in the garden, but um, they're not the star turns because the flowers aren't concentrated enough. So the spring flowers, generally speaking, are the ones that are very concentrated. And then the the, um, spring through summer tend to be uh, more episodic. So it's really a bit like a painting where you add little touches of color through through the scheme. Uh, I just think that the flowers are simple. There are only very few doubles in, in hardy geraniums. They're just a wonderful addition. But also they're because of these pretty mounds of leaves. Because you do need leaves. You can't have you know, full raging flowers all the time. You need some little bit of calm for the eye as well as excitement. Yes. Now, in terms of the episodic bloom or the seasonal bloom, you mentioned uh, Roseanne, did you say, is the exception? Yes, Roseanne, at least in the areas that I'm familiar with, uh, flowers over a very long period of time. Are we talking an entire summer or...? Yes, yes, usually, yes. All right. And then uh, what would you say, I have a friend, uh, and now we're gardening in Zone 4B, and the minute her Johnson's Blue Geranium is done blooming, she cuts it to the ground. She doesn't like the foliage. Does that hurt the plant? No, it doesn't, and it's a really good idea. 
if you don't like it and it and it's looking straggly after it finishes flowering, you can cut many of the hardy geraniums back to about an inch or so above the crown, and the crown is usually at ground level, so you just just grab it by the neck and cut it straight okay. across. And uh, then it will send up new flowers, uh, new leaves and new flowers in most cases, not all cases. Um, you have to know the plant a bit. If you cut, for example, geranium sylvaticum back, it won't reflower, but, uh, but most of them will. And, and always apply a bit of fertilizer. Give them a, a little bit of food when you're doing this, and that helps okay. uh, too. All right. What kind of fertilizer would you put on them? I tell people to use anything they like as long as they use it consistently. Okay. Because there are so many fertilizers on the market, and um, everybody has their favorite, and you can you can use um, organic ones. That's preferable, of course, but uh, anything that you have that's available that you use um, maybe once a month, if you can bring yourself to do that. It's a bit like pruning, you know. We tend to put these things off, but it's good if you're, if you're um, consistent with them. Yes. Now, your book features great garden designers like Marianne Brady, Penny Odie Kellides, uh, Glenn Withy. Is that how you say his name? Yes, yes. Glenn Withy, Charles Price, Connie Umberger, Judy Horton, Craig Bergman, and Elise Zilstra. And these garden greats have given credence to incorporating hardy geraniums in the gardens. They actually list in your book, here are the ones that I like to use for sun, here's the ones that I like to use for shade, and everything in between. But you also get a lot of feedback and information from your customers. It's sort of citizen science results, I think, when you get feedback from your customers who are growing hardy geraniums all over the world. What are some of the standout stories that you've heard from your customers as far as where they're growing them and how they're growing hardy geraniums? Well, I'm always very interested in the climate range because that enables me to help customers um, grow these plants in areas that I might initially think uh, wouldn't work. So I've been extremely grateful to customers who have told me that they're growing plants, particularly in areas such as yours, where we don't have a lot of good information about uh, survival during the winter. Most hardy geraniums will survive the summers, but often they won't survive the winters. And uh, so I don't even get enough information. I would like more because uh, I can only help my customers if the ones that I have now tell me what they're doing. And sometimes I give it a zone 5 because I'm I'm really not sure, and then I find out that it, it does fine in zone 4 or 3, um, and that's extremely helpful. But generally, the letters that I get from customers are, uh, I love the plants, they're, they're beautiful, and I'm happy with growing them and, and all of this. But I'm also on Garden Watchdog, um, Dave's Garden, and um, so people write in about the service we give uh, in terms of the plants we send and, and uh, when we make boo-boos, when we, uh, <laughs> how promptly we <laughs> replace our, our errors, which we make, everybody does. Um, so uh, it, there are nice comments on that, and um, that's, I think, fairly helpful for everybody. But generally speaking, uh, people are not so specific as just that they uh, they enjoy the plants and it's been fascinating for them to try something new as mm. well. Well, and given all of the great benefits of hardy geraniums and the fact that they are so fiercely uh, survivor-oriented, you are able to really ship these out with a high degree of confidence that they're going to do well. Yeah, I think that's interesting, isn't it, that they, that they do do well. And I think it's partly because they're, they're wild and they haven't been, uh, I mean, there are some obviously that have been uh, bred, um, but not a lot of them, surprisingly. Um, a lot of them, the names that we have within the different um, uh, species are selections that gardeners have made in their own gardens, just looking at them and saying, the flower looks different, I'm going to give it a different name. Okay. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I, they're, just a, they're just a wonderful group of plants. They're very, very interesting and, and so tough and easy to grow and so generally free of, of problems. 
Yes, very much so. Well, your book divides hardy geraniums into nine categories. The first is rock gardens and containers. And I love the geranium. Is it cinerium? Uh, You can either say cinerium or cinerium. Yeah. Okay, cinerium or cinerium. Um, They have the deep veining. What are some of your uh, favorites, your customer favorites from this group in the rock gardens and containers category? Yeah, well, we I set up the rock gardens and containers because I wanted plants that would do well in containers, but also in rock garden situations, and that implied that the plant wasn't going to be so enormous that it would attack and run over all of its neighbors, <laughs> okay. and that it would also um, require good drainage, which is one of the requirements for this section. So the one that's probably the most widely planted is geranium ballerina. And that's been around since the 1960s. And uh, it's it's got prominent veins. But there are now some that have gotten darker, um, more veins and a little bit darker colored flowers. So the next one that came along after ballerina was Lawrence Flatman. And I really like that one. And then... In 2000, there was one that's almost purple called Purple Pillow. Purple and Pillow? And that one, Purple Pillow, and it's it's great. It's really, really attractive. And then I happen to like Rothbury Gem, which is a fairly new one, but it's got a really pretty, pretty flower with a little, it's a pink flower that has a deep magenta pink vein, very, very prominent, like, like spider's veins. And uh, a deep pink center, and it's, oh, it's sweet. But then I was in Europe in the summer, and there's a new series come out that isn't in the book um, called the Jolly Jewel series. And they have a whole lot of very bright new colors, and there's one called Night, which is a deep purple, and there's Salmon and Violet. They're just gorgeous. And uh, I'm hoping that I can somehow get the uh, distributor to give me some for, for next year. Wow. It's an exciting group of plants, really. It is. And there, there was one that I adored. I thought it was fantastic, but I quickly just closed my eyes because it's zone seven through nine. But it's dusky, is it Krug? Krug. Krug. Or oh, Krug, I think they call it because okay. it's Welsh. Dusty Krug. Yes. And we always want things that we can't go. I did <laughs> Part of being a gardener, but uh, no, you can't, and um, and we can, but um, it's just not winter hardy. Its parents come from New Zealand, and uh, that's a, a relatively mild mild area. Well, and the foliage on this is what totally drew me in. Is it's these kind of purpley brown tones? Yes, in the fall, it, the the leaves turn a sort of lovely cinnamon color. Mm. Yeah, it's gorgeous. So if you're in zone seven through nine, check that out. That's awesome. Now, the second group was ground covers, and I love ground covers. The The longer I garden, I love them even more. I've always loved them. And I thought geranium mycorrhizum would be great for a northern gardener. So I'm curious what your comments are on this one, and then if you have any other ground covers that you'd recommend for zone three or four. Well, I love geranium macrorhizum too. I think it's just a wonderful weed smothering ground cover uh, with one proviso that you should not plant it where you have some choice little rarity because it is a ground cover and it spreads through the ground with underground rhizomatous roots. Okay. And so it will cover ground, but it weed smothers, it, the leaves are slightly fragrant and... Um, the flowers come in various colors. Um, I like the white, but we also have um, uh, a deep uh, magenta color called Zakor, and uh, we have um, a, a, a white. A lot of gardeners don't like uh, colors in their gardens. They like to do white, white, pure whites. And uh, the geranium family doesn't have a lot of pure whites, but there is one called White Ness. Geranium macro rhizome whiteness. And it was collected, I believe, on Mount Olympus in Greece. And um, because all the macro rhizomes, oddly enough, come from the eastern end of the Mediterranean. But as a favorite, I love geranium uh, macro rhizome album. I think it's beautiful. 
but uh, then we have a, a pale pink too, which is Ingwersen's variety, and um, and Zarkor, and another one called Bevan's variety, and there doesn't seem to be a lot of difference between the two. Hmm. Then for the other ground covers, I really like Cantabrigensi. Uh This is a hybrid between Macrorhizum and Dalmaticum. Again, you have a variation in color. They're mainly pinks and white, but you can choose the one that you you like. Biocovo is probably the widest grown here, and it may well be in where you live as well. I don't know. But uh, it's got white flowers that become a little bit pink as they age. Mm. Um, we also have um, Crystal Rose, which is a Canterbury Gensi, which has vivid, vivid pink flowers. It's just a standout. And... Uh, the flowers seems to flower a little longer than uh, than Biocovo. And then a couple that I really like, one's called Hane, um, and that's H-A-N-N-E, and that has soft pink flowers with a, a little almost white edge to them. Okay. And um, then some of the other ground covers, um, I, Geranium oxonianum is a hybrid. Again, this is uh, was named in England, and it celebrates the University of, of uh, Oxford. Uh, Cambridge, okay. Canterbury NC celebrates Cambridge, if you wondered where the names come from. Yeah, I did wonder. Uh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, Oxonianum is, this is one that seeds around. Now, okay. it's a ground cover, so perhaps you put it in an area where you don't mind if it seeds. But it does seed, and it can be pulled up. Um, you, you select it um, for the color, flower color, or for the uh, leaf zonation, because some of the forms of oxonianum have brown stains on the on the leaves. And I like uh, Catherine Adell. Uh, Catherine Adell has a brown horseshoe sort of blotch on the brown blotch on the leaf, and the flowers are very pale pink with uh, with deeper pink veins. So it's a very pretty ground cover. Uh, but there are also other nice ones. Um, one that I think is really, uh, well, there's a, a, an absolute white one, if you're thinking about white, called Ankham's White. But there also is a very nice one called Hollywood, which um, doesn't have a leaf blotch, but it has, again, pale pink flowers with deeper pink veins. And then there's one called Laura Skelton, which has incredibly deep purple veins and so many veins that it almost fills the entire uh, flower with, with the color. And there are, I think, 80 or different more um, uh, geranium oxonianum selections that you can choose from. So, oxonianum, okay, all right. Oxonianum. Yeah, they're beautiful. They are just beautiful. Yep. I noticed that a lot of these are zone four, at least. I mean, they seem to have a very wide range of zones they that do. they can be grown in for these ground Yes, covers. and I, I mean, I, as far as I know, and I, as I said, before, I can only tell the zones from what my customers tell me. So uh, and every garden has colder spots or warmer spots. So when you're planting, uh, you know, at least initially, you should consider uh, giving them a little more winter protection until you know how they do. Okay. Uh, because I'm, I'm not prescient. I have no idea really um, how things are going to do in people's gardens until they tell me. Yes, but uh, as far as I know, the, these are these are zone four, and if they're not zone four, I'd dearly love to hear, you know, what people's experiences are with them. Yes, well, and you know, the other thing I'm curious about is the vigorousness. So, for instance, when I want a ground cover, I want a ground cover. I want one that is going to cover some ground, especially since we've only got about a four to five month window here, you know, for things right. to really go to town. So what is, in your regard, one of the more vigorous hardy geranium ground covers? I think that geranium macrorhizum is the most vigorous. Okay. Now, it, you plant it one year, and it will take, I think, two to three years to really cover the ground, okay. truly cover it. But it will get going uh, almost immediately, and uh, by the end of the third year, you'll have a, 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 a total coverage. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'm going to give that a go. 
Well, shade was your next category. And I loved your section on shade because shade is something that most gardeners encounter at some point, you know, whether they whether they start out that way or whether they're um, ending that way because their trees are maturing or whatnot. But you're not talking about completely zero sun for hardy geraniums. They need some dappled uh, shade, dappled sun uh, in order to grow successfully, right? Yes, I think that's true. You know, shade is one of these words that it gives people some problems because it's, it encompasses in a way too much uh, because shade can be anything from light shade that gets reflection from something, some area that's very sunny or um, shade that's dappled or shade that is so dark that really only plastic flourishes in it. You know, the sort of shade you get right up against the house or underneath the steps or underneath the deck. Now, gerani- hardy geraniums won't go in that, that kind of shade. They, 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 they wouldn't survive. But what they do survive in is light shade, bright shade, dappled shade, and even up to some of them to medium shade but not not totally dark and obscure shade. Okay. And even, I would say, if ferns are growing well in your shade, then probably hardy geraniums won't. So, um, oh, they won't? Need, I think where you're, you're growing heavy ferns, um, uh, I mean large ferns, that I think that that possibly is too shady. But every time I pronounce on anything, I'm always somebody tells me that I'm wrong. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I have to. I have to temper all of these these remarks by saying, of course, you, your experience may be different. Your experience may be different. Okay, so here's one for you. I had shared with the listener community for the podcast that I was interviewing you, and uh, one of my friends, Jen McGinnis of the blog Frau Zenny, a gardening blog, she is in Zone 6B. And she said, would you please ask Robin if there's any shade hardy geranium that I can grow beneath my black walnut tree? Oh, oh dear. <laughs> that, that is because I believe that black walnuts, don't they release some sort of compound into the ground which yes. discourages growth. That's exactly right. Well, and some plants can handle it. She's So some hostas uh, or hostas I think she's found and uh, I'm trying to think. She I had interviewed her and she was sharing with me because she's trying to compile you know, her list of options. But uh, she's like, will you please ask her? And I just, you know, mm, I'm not an expert in the black walnut area. So No, I haven't had any personal experience of of it, and I haven't heard from anybody who has. But perhaps uh, in this uh, podcast, we could, somebody might be able to suggest something. I, I just don't know. Um, I mean, we can try, for example, as I mentioned, the macrorhizum and, and um, Canterbrigensi, because they really are tough ground covers. And I've seen them out in around public buildings in my area where, you know, people walk on them and... Uh, Dogs uh, walk on them, and and worse, and uh, they just uh, they just seem fine. They they survive all of those those kinds of things. But uh, I don't know about about walnuts. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, and maybe their wild nature will assist them. Yeah, it's it's entirely possible. It just uh, I I think the 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 thing with this is just to try a couple of different things and see if they work. Okay. Um, yeah. All right, we'll give it a go. Now, for shade, I like the, is it Fium? Yes, yes. Um, I like them, too. I love them. I think that they're just irresistible. Um, The flowers aren't very large, but they're incredibly sweet, and they flower rather early in the spring for us. Uh, I'm not quite sure whether they work for you. When do they come into flower for you? You know, I don't have them here because they are... Uh, zone five. Yes. Well, I have Monacensi zone um, four. D- do you grow that one? I don't grow that one either. So that's one I have to look into. Is yeah. that one zone four? I I've called it zone four because I've had customers that have grown it in zone four, and perhaps a geranium theum can be grown in zone four. Again, I don't know because okay. I don't have enough feedback on it. When I 
uh, assigned um, zones to plants in the book, I did it based on, A, what my customers told me, and B, um, uh, some knowledge of where they came from in the first place. Uh, okay. You know, whether they came from mountainous areas and, and how much snow they were subjected to and winter cold and so forth. But I'm very conservative, and it's and it could be that these plants are more cold tolerant than, than I have assigned numbers to them. And so it's just a matter of um, of testing them and, and seeing what works. Okay. And how do you yeah. say that one uh, where that starts with an X? Uh, X? Ma- Monazins? Monocensi. 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 It just, it's just the Latin for Munich. And it oh. was a hybrid between um, geranium theum and geranium, geranium reflexum. Okay. And it's, and it's the Latin for Munich? It's the Latin for Munich. As in Germany? Yes. Really? Yeah. Latin's fun, actually, after a while. If you can... Uh, you can <laughs> it's, uh, it, it, it's a lot of the plant names refer to the characteristics of the plant or from people who discovered them, and, and so it's a little bit like doing a history. You, you mm. can find out a lot about the plant by knowing what the name means. That's well, in Monazensi, if it is Munich, then um, just latitude, longitude, or I suppose latitude-wise, they are, um, I think, in the same parallel as Minnesota, so that could potentially work here. Yeah, well, it's it's a hybrid. So uh, uh, one of its parents is Fium, uh, which we were uh, going to talk about, and uh, yeah. the other one is Reflexum. And this one apparently was found in Upper Bavaria, um, the geranium monocensi. The flowers are smaller than a Fium, and so I actually like the Fium because the flowers are just a little larger. But um, it's such a, a, a... Either of them. They're just charming plants for woodland gardens and... Uh, since they flower uh, relatively early in the spring, and they have um, the flowers are well above the level of the leaves, um, they're just very attractive. Now, they're not going to knock your socks off from the, the point of view of, of uh, flower size because uh, usually they're about mm, slightly under an inch in diameter. Okay. Three quarters of an inch, I think. But uh, they're profuse, and they come in uh, lots of lovely colors, including brown, which I... I mean, I've been gardening for many years, so I tend to garden into really odd colors, but uh, I love brown brown (laughs) flowers. And um, they come also in white and pink and and lavender and and a rather muddy, bricky color, which is is also attractive. Oh, that does sound good. Yeah. Geranium theum also has a lovely white called uh, theum album. And... um, and a couple of them, oddly enough, have interesting leaves. Um, Samabor is one that was collected in Croatia a number of years ago, and that has a very dark blotch on the leaves. And actually, you'd think dark in shade would, wouldn't work, but it somehow does. Somehow mm. the shade gives intensity to the, to the brown color, and it's, it looks really attractive. Well, the next section covered is called Scramblers and Crawlers. These sound so fun. And, of course, the one that caught my eye is one that's called Jester's Jack. I'm turning to it right now. But it is mostly variations of green, if I remember correctly. It is. It has a bit of pink in it, too. Its parents are scary, but uh, Jester's jacket is is kind of attractive. I mean, I'd like, as I think I said earlier, the... uh, Geraniums generally have a fairly short flowering period. I mean, they'll flower in the spring. Yes. So we look for leaves and leaf color to give us a, an extension of the, of, the, of the season so that, uh, that the plant, um, if the plant has interesting shaped leaves or if they've got different colors on them, that helps to give us an interest in another season. Mm. And so uh, plants like that, I think, work, uh, work well generally. Yes. Uh, and also, um, there are some that do that seem to do really well. I uh, there's one that we have called Blue Sunrise. Um, now that does well in Chicago, and I don't know how much colder you are than Chicago. Is your area more rigorous than that? Oh yes, mm-hmm. it is. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I, then I, it may be that Blue Sunrise wouldn't wouldn't survive for you, okay. but. Um, Ones that might do well. Uh, can you grow Roseanne or is that? Yes. Yep, we can grow Roseanne. You can. Oh, that's wonderful. 
Uh, there's another one called Vlasovianum. It, it's a terrible mouthful of a name, <laughs> and it's spelled W-L-A-S-S-O-V-I-A-N-U-M. That one um, has beautiful fall color, um, cinnamony colored leaves, and the flowers are a kind of purple color, but the, uh, but the uh, leaves in the fall are really pretty. So that's another extension of the of the growing season that you can use these plants for. Okay. I'm making a note. Yes, I see it here in the book. That yeah. is a mouthful, isn't it? W L A S S. I know it is. Vianum. Yeah, where is that from, by the way? Do you know? Uh Siberia. Okay. Uh, uh, Siberia, Mongolia, uh into northern China. Right. The flower's not brilliant, but um, but it's attractive. I mean, it's not as if it's it's ugly or anything, but uh, it's the fall color and the leaves that I I, I like for the it. fall color. Yeah, I like the fall color too. And you say in here it's zones four through nine, so that's quite a wide range as well. Yes. And I'm optimistic when I hear the word Siberia, I think of Minnesota. So. Yes, that's good, isn't it? So we we need to we need to really look at plants and and try and um, and decide where where they're um, you know whether they have any relevance to us. I mean, there are some plants that you'd think that I could grow everything out here on the west coast, but I can't. Uh, I can't grow plants that require a cool summer. Oh, okay. Um, for example, geranium Lambertii, which is an absolutely beautiful plant that comes from the Himalayas. Uh, I can't grow it because the summer out here is simply too warm for it. Yeah. Well, I wondered, too, when you were mentioning the alpine hardy geraniums, that they might do better in my colder climate as well. I don't know whether you'd have to give them winter protection because I think it's too cold for them. It's just too cold. I think so, yeah. I'm not positive, and maybe I I can be corrected on this. I'd be happy to be corrected, actually, but... uh, I would think that uh, that they they would not survive, but I may be wrong. I just don't know. Hmm. You know, uh, one of the things that you had mentioned was the fact that after they are done blooming, you're left with that foliage. What are some of the standout leaves um, that, if you were going to recommend people grow it instead of for the flower, but they grow it for the leaves, are there a couple of that? immediately come to mind for you? Well, I, I, I'm, I'm not sure about Minnesota because I'd have to stop and, and think too long, but I I like the mounds of leaves from Geranium Magnificum. Um, that has beautiful leaves, and um, even when it's not in flower, the leaves are, are very handsome looking. But I think the, the leaves that I mentioned, Geranium Fium Samabor, with its, with its beautiful uh, zones on the leaf, um, there's a geranium called uh, sandrine, which comes out with yellow leaves in the spring. There's a geranium theum called Mrs. Withy Price um, that has uh, yellow leaves, bright yellow leaves in the spring with little red internodal dots, mm-hmm. and that one's attractive. So I think we can we can use the leaves for the various seasons, just finding out the plants that have them, and and then. Uh, making uh, making uh, use of them. But then the, the uh, ground cover leaves are beautiful. I think um, geranium macrorhizum has handsome, uh, handsome leaves. And, uh, um, you know, all of the geranium leaves are like your palm, and uh, they've got uh, five to seven to nine lobes. Um, they're, some of them are very dissected, and some of them are almost entire with, with very shallow dissections. But they uh, they look great. Uh, of course, we have some that you can't grow, and, and 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 in fact, only people on the west coast can grow, like geranium madarensi, which comes from the island of Madeira, and that has a dinner plate size leaf, and that's fabulous in the garden. A but, dinner um, plate size, wow! Yeah, it's wonderful. But then there's there's a geranium harvii from South Africa with with little tiny gray, brilliantly gray leaves, and that's charming too. Oh. So uh, you know these are addictive. You have to be careful. I see that. Well, yes. and the fifth section is called borders and beds, and here the simple geranium joy made me smile. That one is just innocence incarnate, isn't it? It's sweet. It's very sweet. 
Very sweet. And uh, yeah, it. But it's not for you. No, it's not for me. It's it's it was in zone eight eight and nine. But that picture just stopped me in my tracks when I when I flipped to that. I was like, oh my goodness, look at this. But my yeah. geranium, um, my good old standby Johnson's blue is listed here, and it grows very well in my zone four garden. And I also noticed that geranium is it sanguinium. Yes, yes. And that is zone four tolerant. What do you think about that one? Well, I hope it's zone four tolerant for everyone. Um, it's certainly an, an incredibly versatile plant, and it comes in many different sizes. And uh, again, a, a fairly narrow range of color, uh, white with all kinds of different pinks through uh, magenta pink. But um, the sizes, it ranges in sizes from something that's about uh, two or three inches high to something that's uh, sort of attack mode at, at uh, four feet. So oh. uh, you can uh, you can pick <laughs> your pick your plant with this this uh, this particular species. Oh my gosh! And, well, who and is it's, four feet uh, tall here? Which one of them? Uh, I've seen Elspeth at four feet and Cedric Morris at four feet. Oh my gosh! Easily four feet. And um, I actually saw once a uh, geranium uh, sanguinium album as a very tall plant as well. But uh, they just, they can get up there. Um, but it's a tough plant. It's easy to grow, totally easy to grow. And uh, again, in some areas, I believe it has good fall color. Not, not on the West Coast. We don't have enough cold for it, but okay. uh, in colder areas. Well, I tell you what, we have, you know, we're not even officially into fall yet here uh, at the time of this interview. It's uh, September 20th, but the days are getting shorter. It is dark for sure by seven o'clock and the leaves just immediately start to go, you know, when you're in Minnesota <laughs> and the state fair is over, you can pretty much guarantee that uh, fall is going to kick it into high gear, whether it's warm outside or not, just the shorter days alone will start to trigger it, so... Well, we can only envy you. Uh, so it's <laughs> it's a mutual envy, I think, for different reasons, yes. Well, yeah. can you share a little bit about the very popular Roseanne? It's absolutely an amazing plant. Um, I hear that over 6 million of these plants, probably more by now, have been sold, which means that it, it must be being grown by gardeners in very many different um, situations uh, out here on the west coast, it can be in flower most of the time, almost all of the time. I've seen it in January in San Francisco in full flower, but uh, that's a very mild climate. So, uh, but for I think it's uh, it's just a, a very easy plant to grow. It's patented, so that means that it can't be. Um, uh, it has to be bought from somebody who's licensed to, to sell it, um, and it can't be divided by by people. You know, you can't divide it and, and um, spread it around the garden. But um, it's uh, it's just the, the thing that seems to draw people to it is the flower color, and it's blue with a pale to almost white center. It just looks charming, and it fits in with everybody's idea of gardening. You can grow it in a container. You can grow it. I think you can even grow it in a hanging basket if you want to. And you can grow it in the ground where it probably looks the best. Hmm. But you could grow it over a wall or um, in a, a regular perennial garden. Um, very versatile. And looking at it, I mean, there's nothing really in the... Well, there is in the parentage. It comes from a Himalayan geranium, or two Himalayan geraniums. One that's called Buxton's variety, which was a very pale blue with a white eye, and a an unnamed form of geranium Himalayansi. Hmm. So those are its two parents. And it, and it uh, was found in um, somebody's garden in England. Oh, get originally. out. Huh. Yeah. So uh, this astonishing plant that's been so successful, and uh, literally, I mean, I have customers from Seattle to San Diego who can grow it, and from New York to Georgia, um, and all points in between. Everybody seems to be able to grow it just about. Wow, that little so, guy wants to live. 
I think so. Um, it, the only thing that I've noticed about it is that it takes at least, I would say, two to three years to get to reasonable size in the garden. Okay. So you plant it the first year and it sits there and makes a few roots and, and, and a few flowers. Second year it looks better. And then the third year you can call in the neighbors and, and the, <laughs> the garden magazine and uh, whatever because it will look wonderful. I love that, Robin. That's awesome. Now, I have to ask you, too. I forgot to ask you this. Um, there's the geranium. Is it Delmatican? Yes, Delmaticum. What's the origin of that name? Do you know? It comes from Dalmatia. That's and, what uh, I wondered. East, eastern end of the Mediterranean. And it's, um, it's the, the littlest version of those three, mac, uh, Macrorhizum, Cantabrigensi, and Dalmaticum, the shortest. So uh, it grows to about oh, just a few inches high. And again, it comes in a, a white and a pink blush and a, and a pink the only thing that I notice about Dalmaticum, and I actually like it a lot as a ground cover, but it has a very short flowering period, and here it only flowers in the month of May, and oh. then no flowers for the rest of the year. And then is it very lush? Um, it's not so much lush as, as well, it covers it certainly covers the ground, so you wouldn't see soil through the leaves. Okay. But it's not lush the way Macrorhizum is lush. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Now, there's a section that's devoted to tuberous rooted species. And <laughs> I, I was reading this and I had such a difficult time embracing these guys. They seem very finicky. And I obviously won't be able to grow them here. But I had no idea there were tuberous rooted uh, hardy geraniums. They've always been favorites of mine. I think as you garden uh, over a very long period of time, as I have, that you get totally hung up with the, the oddest plants. And I just <laughs> love the idea that this family or this genus had had uh, tuberous-rooted uh, uh, members. And some of them, I mean, most of them come from um, either uh, Asia, Asia Minor or... Um, Persia, uh, the Middle East, and uh, they're from cold areas, generally speaking, mountainous areas. Um, and what's fascinating about them, to me at least, because I love to look at the roots of things, is that these have very strange-looking tubers. And uh, some of them look like uh, little spaceships, and some of them look like um, scorpions, and mm. some of them look like little p potatoes, huh. these very strange roots. What they do, I've been told, is that they grow um, as plants on the edge of snow. And so they wake up when the snow starts to melt and they grow during a, a fairly short season and come into flower and then they go do dormant again as the water decreases. So okay. the, if you grow them, you have to give them a period of summer uh, dormancy. You have to let, stop watering them and let them go totally dry. A lot of us are collectors, and so uh, there's, a, there's a certain charm in collecting these, these plants. And there's a wonderful nursery in Latvia that supplies these plants. And um, so I usually order mine, or at least I've ordered the ones that I'm not producing in quantity, from this nursery in Latvia. And uh, that's also in the back of my, uh, back of my book. Wow. But if I had a couple of favorites, I, I love uh, Geranium malviflorum. I think that one is absolutely beautiful. And uh, that one comes from, that one actually comes from um, Morocco and Algeria and southern Spain. But it's not winter hardy. And um, uh, you'd probably, that's only for people on the West Coast. Yeah. Well, and I saw in your notes for that one, it says, no summer water. These guys cannot have wet feet. No. Because they come from the edges of snow patches or glaciers, and they just, uh, when the water dries up, that's it. They, they go into, into hibernation. Hmm. Very interesting. Well, the seventh category was for annuals and biennials, which I didn't know there were biennials. Do you get a I, lot of demand for these? I do in mild winter areas, but not on the East Coast. Okay. Because the biennial ones, geranium madarensi and canariensi palmatum, 
uh, all grow during the winter. So they're not dormant in the winter, they're in active growth, and then they come into flower in the spring. Oh, interesting. And so it has to be a relatively mild climate. Or if you have a greenhouse, you can grow them in a greenhouse. Oh, um, that's great fact, to know. The first, first time I saw geranium madarensi was in England, and I was in the botanic garden at Cambridge University, botanic garden, and I saw a huge line of people going out of the door of a greenhouse. So I didn't know what they were lining up for, but I joined the line. And when I got to the head of the line, there was geranium madarensi in a in a 48-inch box, and it was in full flower. And uh, it was it was fantastic. Now, we don't need to put it in the greenhouse on the West Coast because it's, uh, you know, our climate is mild, but... Um, because it grows in the winter, it's subject to cold, and uh, it would die. Okay. But it, it's fun to, fun to grow in a greenhouse at any rate. Yeah, very fun to grow in a greenhouse. The most common annual is geranium robertianum, but it's probably the most invasive and pernicious, and I don't recommend anyone grow it, really, because it seeds around like crazy. Oh, it does? Now, it does. Every, now, some people say, I, I, I'd love to be invaded, but most people don't. And uh, no one would thank me if uh, they had for the next uh, 30 or 40 years uh, geranium robertianum popping up in their garden. Geranium <laughs> robertianum. Wow, where is that one from? It's European. It's the oldest recorded uh, uh, geranium, oddly enough. And it's sometimes called Herb Robert. Okay, Herb Robert. Okay. Well, yeah. we're going to stay away from him. Yes. All right. Well, the last two categories were for the North American and South American species. What are some of the standouts in your mind from both of these groupings? Well, I just love geranium maculatum. I think it's a wonderful woodland plant, and I've seen it growing in gardens in the east, and it looks magnificent. It's a, it's a wild plant. It's not a, not a cultivated plant, although there have been a couple of selections from it which have been really attractive, one of which is Geranium Maculatum Elizabeth Ann, which has a beautiful chocolatey colored leaves and pink flowers. And uh, that one is very handsome, but I think possibly it would not work for you in your climate. Okay. I think it's, I think it's, uh, it was discovered in a garden in Maryland, and uh, I think it's just not, not, uh, not going to work. One that might work, and I just don't know anough about it, is Geranium arianthum. Now, that one is found up in Alaska, and it's also found in, um, in, uh, Siberia and in some of the <laughs> islands, it's found in um, Japan and uh, also in British Columbia. Okay. And that one just seems to have a wide range, and uh, the flowers look beautiful. And I don't, I don't see why one couldn't couldn't grow that. Um, I've had uh, uh, customers who have collected it in Alaska for me, and. Uh, it's done fine in my garden as well as um, a number of other ones. But the flower color on that, um, it's usually sort of uh, pale pink or white or even pale to dark blue. And then it can have various colored veins as well. It's just a very nice, um, easy uh, North American native. Um, Viscosissimum is another one. That's found in the Rockies from about, I think, two and a half to 8,000 feet. Uh, so the 8,000-foot ones might, might work. Okay. Um, large pink flowers, um, sticky uh, stems and leaves, and um, not heavy flowering, but actually quite beautiful when it's in flower and in the garden. But I never see it in people's gardens. Uh, it's one of those that just hasn't, hasn't made it into, the, into horticulture. And that's the viscosissimum? This viscosissimum, which just means very sticky. That's literally what that means. Yes. Oh, isn't that interesting? And the stem is sticky. Yes, the stem's sticky too. Yeah, it has glandular hairs, and they're they're sticky, sticky hairs. And then from the South African ones, um, I, Magnaflorum grows well in the Denver Botanic Garden, and it looks like large mounds of parsley with these uh, lavender purple flowers. I love it. I think it's a beautiful plant, and I and I don't see anyone growing that. 
And then one that you'd have to put in the greenhouse in the winter is geranium harvii from South Africa. And that has just these beautiful little quarter-sized uh, um, silver leaves. Uh, flowers aren't terribly um, profuse, but the leaves are what you'd grow for. Okay. All right. Now, I have a question. As we were talking about these, um, uh, hardy geraniums as cut flowers, are they a cut oh. flower? Do they make a good cut flower? You know, I, ha- I don't usually cut flowers from my plants. Um, I, ha- I have on one occasion brought a bouquet into the house and it, it lasted for a few days, but I couldn't really comment on it. I, I'd have to defer to people who do more cut flowers than I do. Mm-hmm. I don't know is the short answer. Okay. I, I don't know how, it, how they would work. I think, I, I mean, I, I'm thinking here completely in terms of my, you know, Johnson's blue geranium, but right. as they do in the in the garden, I would see them playing a supporting role in a bouquet, you know, like we'll tuck a few here and there. I can't, I don't even think I'd have a fistful of my Johnson's blue geraniums, even in the spring, um, because it's very sparsely flowered. It's not like it's flush with, you know, like just flowers everywhere. Um, Uh It's not that kind of a plant. But um, I was curious about that as you were talking and I was thinking, hmm, I wonder if people do use them in bouquets. I think that your listeners probably will know, and I, I simply don't, and I'd be fascinated to to hear. But I think you're right about uh, the flowers, that, that we really want them in the garden so that they can provide this, the display, because um, geraniums bloom on ever-extending flowering stems. So if you cut out the flowering stem, that's it. I mean, it'll send up a new flowering stem usually, eventually. Okay. But you might have to wait for it, whereas um, if you just leave them, then it'll produce a couple of flowers, and then in a little while, it'll produce another couple of flowers okay. on, the, on the stem as it lengthens. Okay. And so, by the way, yeah. which, which hardy geranium made the cover of the book? Uh, anthocard. Anthocard. Uh, geranium anthocard. And I just wanted to say one word about the photography, because I am so indebted to two photographers for this book. One of them was my friend Don Reiners from Sacramento, California. And he came over to my nursery so many times and photographed the plants. He was just an amazing, uh, he's an amazing photographer. The flowers are, look beautiful. Uh, and the other person is Saxon Holt, who is a, a garden photographer, and he did the, the pictures of some of the, uh, some of the close-ups, but almost all of the, uh, the garden photos. And so... Uh, you can't write a book about um, flowers without having wonderful photographs, I think. And uh, so I was incredibly fortunate for these two men. Well, they are beautiful. The, fl- the flowers are absolutely beautiful. Were, are most of the pictures from your garden? Yes, most of them are. I have a couple of photos from my garden in the, in the book, but the mug shots are almost all from my garden. Wow. How big is this nursery where you're at? Is it acres and acres? No, it's tiny. Um, I have a, a half acre and um, then another area that I grow outside around a 10,000 square foot commercial greenhouse that has my uh, pelargoniums in it. Okay. So um, it's not a very large nursery. Um, I can manage it with, um, you know, generally speaking, with uh, some help. And uh, um, it's... Uh, and it's grown, you know. I, I started off in, in 1983 with uh, 33 plants for sale. So <laughs> I didn't have a, didn't have a clue. <laughs> wow. Huh. Yeah. And when these photographers are coming uh, to, to do a photo shoot, how many hours are they out there taking pictures? Oh, well... Uh, you know, Don, um, the, who did all the, the close-ups, or did most of the close-ups, um, it would be a, he'd come for a couple of hours, two or three hours usually. Really? And he drove um, from Sacramento, which was 80 miles away. So, uh, I mean, it was just a, a labor of love for him, and he, and he's, uh, he mm-hmm. was so kind. And uh, I'm, I'm incredibly fortunate in, in knowing these people. And, mm-hmm. uh, and so his work... Uh, 
is just it's just so interesting and uh, and I think it's genuinely helpful uh, to see a close up of the flower. Now you can find um, garden photos of these plants, some of them, but not all of them. But to actually look at them closely and see the variations is is really interesting. Yes, because most of them are are, are white and pink and and dark uh, dark pink. Uh, those are most of the, and blue, and those are most of the colours. Yes, but uh, we have forty eight different geraniums that are blue, or violet, or purple. So that's amazing, too. And we only really thought about that after we'd taken the photos of them. Yes. Well, and, you know, the the Plant Lovers series, uh, what's great about it is they really honed in on people who were growing these plants and asked them to write these books. And so you were the natural choice for geraniums. When you were trying to orchestrate uh, the photography, you had to know that, okay, these are blooming, this is the time you need to come now because it, especially right. if it's spring, right? And the majority of yeah. them are blooming in spring. It was a flurry of activity then. Yes, In what, true. March through June or something? Yes, but and then, of course, there were plants that I had that didn't flower the year that I needed them to flower. Oh, my gosh. And, <laughs> and then there were some that... There were a few, just a handful that died. And oh. so, you know, I could only put in the book the plants that, that we actually had flowers for. So um, there are a few that are missing, but um, I think there's enough in the book yes. that it will give everyone an opportunity to, to try them. And that's that's really the point of it, is is to try this wonderful group of plants and uh, and see how different they are from from the Pelagoniums. And it's a whole new and different experience. Yes. Well, I love it. I think it's fantastic. And I love the, the North American uh, varieties, if they can be incorporated into this whole movement of going native, you know, planting more natives in the garden, if people can be thinking about that and incorporating these uh, North, North American hardy geraniums into the landscape, I think that would be marvelous. Well, I do too, because I think that it's it's lovely to see some of our North North uh, North American geraniums. Geranium maculatum is in people's gardens, in some people's gardens, um, but the, the ones from the West uh, are not. Uh, we have geranium Richardsonii, uh, geranium Californicum, uh, there's geranium Oregonum up in Oregon. Um, uh, you know, we have other ones that that other people can uh, can use, and uh, I think that it's lovely to see wildflowers in, in uh, that have been captured and brought into our gardens. Hmm. Now, I have to ask before we close the show: um, propagation. You do have some pages that cover this, and in the past, uh, for instance, when I'm out there with my Johnson's blue geranium. I'll just take a big knife and cut it into pieces, and then I put those little clumps around in my garden. Am I doing something wrong? Is there something I should be doing um, in a different way, I guess, to divide these clumps up? No, I, I think you're for Johnson's Blue, you're doing the right thing, though I usually pr- prefer to use my hands just because... I cause less damage to the roots than I do when I'm I'm chopping them up. But, you know, okay. I, I also chop them up as well. But uh, I've covered fairly exhaustively in the book the different um, strategies you use for different kinds of hardy geraniums. For example, the geranium cinerium group, you can't do that because it has a, um, a tap-like root and uh, then the... Um, the growing points look like your fingers, you know, the, so you can't. You you have to cut them off uh, individually and uh, put them in um, uh, some sort of potting medium, just like you would with a pelargonium. Okay. Um, you'd start them that way, and then they would develop roots. But uh, I've covered it in the book. I think as far as I can. Um, of course, the, the tuberous rooted ones are the easiest because you just separate the tubers. But uh, yes. So that's uh, that's that's pretty easy. But uh, the the things like geranium macrorhizum, you you can just cut those up and uh, with a with a with a knife or, or pull them apart with your hands and uh, plant them. And they'll have as long as they have roots attached, or even sometimes if they don't, uh, they'll they'll take root very easily. Hmm. Well, let's close the interview with conservancy. 
These are wildflowers, uh, these true geraniums. Are they endangered? Some of them are deeply endangered. The ones that are the most endangered are the ones that come from the islands of Hawaii. So anybody who goes to Hawaii must know that that the native geraniums that grow there, um, I think six out of the seven, are are, are highly endangered. And uh, it's very sad because they are unique. They're totally unlike the other North American geraniums. Um, They're woody shrubs that look, well, they don't look like a geranium at all. And uh, some of them are very beautiful, and they're a source of nectar, um, at least geranium arboreum is, for the Apapani and the Iivi, the uh, nectar, little nectar, native nectar birds uh, in Hawaii. Uh, Madarensi, geranium Madarensi is endangered in Madeira because of habitat destruction. And then there are a whole lot of geraniums that are found in South America and North Africa, and they're endangered because of climate change, because the climate has changed and their their niche has become drier and hotter and sunnier. They're starting to disappear. Maybe not the ones that we grow in our gardens yet, but it's something that we all should be aware of, I think. Yes. And the Hawaiian uh, hardy geraniums, what is endangering them? What's causing this? Well, part of it is habitat destruction, uh, part of it is wild pigs, which dig them up. Oh. Um, part of it is they're in areas that have been, well, habitat destruction truly it is probably the worst aspect of it. But um, the pigs, for example, are a, a, have been a terrible problem for, for uh, geranium arboreum, which is on the red list. Um, and what happens is the pigs come along and they rotate till around the around the plants and then any seeds that have fallen off uh, can't develop and um, and so the plant can't reproduce itself hmm. and um, it's uh, it's just very sad. Two of the um, native Hawaiian geraniums are found in swamps and they grow in in water in huge amounts of rainfall. Oh wow! And uh, they just, uh, they haven't been well studied, but they're just, uh, and they can't be, they can't be grown by gardeners because they, the kind of situation they need for growth is too difficult for us to reproduce. So geranium multiflorum, which I've seen growing down in the crater of, of um, Haleakala on the island of Maui, um, that one um, requires fog and high altitude and uh, and volcanic rock and all the things that, you know, I can't produce in my garden in the north of San Francisco. Through Cambridge Botanic Garden, I, I grew some seeds one time, and they lasted for a year, uh, but they just they just couldn't survive. It's just not um, there. We just don't have the right situation. For yeah, them. not their ecology. So are horticulturists in Hawaii aware of this and doing something about it? I don't know. Um, I heard that somebody was growing uh, um, geranium cuneatum, which is the one that's l- that's not endangered. Um, it's a grey shrub uh, with little creamy white flowers. But uh, I don't know what's happened about it recently. I don't. I haven't. I haven't heard. Hmm. Interesting. Well, Robin, I can't thank you enough for spending all this time with us talking about uh, something so near and dear to your heart, hardy geraniums and geraniums, the entire family, actually. Um, If people are interested in buying your book, they can go to Amazon and uh, find it there as well as in bookstores, right, all over. Well, there's a link on my website. So if you go to my website, um, just click on the uh, on the uh, the link. It will take you straight to Amazon. Okay. And your website is geraniace dot com, and that's again G E R A N I A C E A E dot com. Geraniace dot com. All right. And we will have links to that as well um, so that people can get a hold of uh, of you. And uh, the website is the best place to get a hold of you. And you interact with customers every single day. I do. Every single day. 
If anyone wants to write to me, I'm more than happy to respond. Should I give my email address? Certainly, that would be great. It's geraniac, a bit like maniac, (laughs) G-E-R-A-N-I-A-C, at packbell, P-A-C-B-E-L-L, dot net. Packbell.com, or dot net. That must be your, um, your local internet provider over there. It was 100 years ago, but I've kept it because I'm, I'm really fond of geraniac. Geraniac. You geraniac, you. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> well, and you've been so generous. You're going to give five copies of your book away to some of our lucky listeners. So that's fantastic. Good. Well, I'm delighted to do it. So uh, and I hope people enjoy it. I'm certain that they will. I know I did. I absolutely love it. Mine is dog-eared, and uh, there's yellow post-its all through it. And you are also lovingly referred to as the geranium lady by so many people, especially locally, I bet. Yes, it's, it's, it's really funny. Sometimes when I'm in areas where I'm not associated with horticulture and somebody will come up behind me and say, why, it's the geranium lady. <laughs> I like it. I like it a lot. It's very nice. (laughs) It's lovely. Well, thank you again so much, Robin, for all of your time and information. I know I have a deeper appreciation for these plants as a result of reading your book and also for pelargoniums after talking to you. This was delightful. Well, thank you so much. And, and, you know, because I love the hardy geraniums doesn't mean that I don't love the the, the pelargoniums. It's just an incredible family, and uh, I encourage everyone to explore it a little more. Well, and I'm glad you mentioned that because you do sell both. You grow and sell both. And how many varieties between the hardy geraniums and the pelargoniums do you have? I'm really embarrassed to say this, but I think I have over a thousand taxa in the the geranium family. (laughs) That is amazing. Do you have one? Do you have one favorite that you could just... We won't tell the rest. We won't tell the other 999, but is there any one that... <laughs> if I had favorite ones... People ask me this all the time, but you know, <laughs> I have different favorites in different categories. Um, we didn't talk about so many aspects of the Pelagonians, the tuberous, rooted, night-scented ones, and the ones that have flowers that look like roses and all of these other things. I have a whole heap of favorites, and um, <laughs> probably there are very few I don't like. Well, it's like picking your favorite child, right? It's impossible. Yes, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you again. This was absolutely splendid. I just, I'm so thrilled that I got a chance to talk to you and talk about this book in particular. That was Well, thank you so much. I hope that people who are listening um, get some some information out of it and uh, and are encouraged to try at least one of the plants in the in the family. I'm sure they will. Well, and you know, at some point it would be great to talk to you about pelargoniums. Yes, I'd love to. I I I also like them. Yes. Well, they're mm-hmm. fantastic. You know, uh, once you get past uh, you know, grandma's old red geranium, and you start moving into some of the scented ones. They're amazing. I know. We grow 150 different scented leaf pelargoniums, and uh, <sighs> they're all extremely interesting, but many other ones as well. So uh, this is what happens when you, you get enthused on, about one family and you find out how complicated and diverse and interesting it is. And uh, uh, I mean, you could do this with other with other plants as well, not just uh, the geranium family. But, right. Uh, yeah, that's exactly right. Wow. Well, you have a great rest of your day, Robin. Thank you so very much. This was an absolute pleasure for me. Thank you very much. I, I really enjoyed it. Goodbye. All right. Bye-bye. Well, that's it for the show today. I want to thank Robin Pearer. Was that just tremendous? She is such a wonderfully knowledgeable plants woman when it comes to this family of plants. She knows it better than almost anyone on this side of the globe. And as I said in the introduction, she loves both of the sides of this family, the hardy geraniums and the pelargoniums equally. She shows no favoritism and she truly appreciates their strength 
strengths and opportunities. I just can't thank Robin enough. And if you enjoyed this episode, you can thank Robin by sharing this episode with a friend and recommending her book or buying her book, The Plant Lover's Guide to Hardy Geraniums. It's a great investment. Well, I want to thank my team at Podfly Productions, David Myers, Ein Kadena, and David Gregerson. And just a reminder that I'll have all of the generous information that Robin shared on the show today in the show notes for this episode, episode 551, under the Still Growing Podcast link in the menu on my website at sixfootmama.com. That's the number six, F-T-M-A-M-A. And sixfootmama.com is also the home to the show, the Still Growing Podcast. Don't forget that you can request to join our listener community. It's in Facebook. It's a group, and it's called the Still Growing Podcast Group. Just look it up on Facebook and then request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. You can also find a link to the group on the menu in my website, and it's going to say Facebook group. So go ahead, click on it. I'd love to see you in the group. You can talk to guests of the show. You can talk to other listeners of the show and get curated content from me in between episodes. Well, that's it, everyone. Have a wonderful week. Stay warm. We're getting a blizzard, and we've got an out-of-town basketball tournament. So that's going to make for an exciting weekend. Have a great week, everyone. Still Growing with Jennifer Ebling is a sixfootmama.com production made in lovely Maple Grove, Minnesota. Still Growing is a weekly gardening podcast dedicated to helping you and your garden grow.